This is the fourth Sunday in Lent. Have you ever known a person who complained about everything? Uh -huh. Nothing was ever good, you know. Isn't it annoying to be around somebody like that? Imagine if you were the pastor of a complaining congregation. Imagine if your congregation numbered in the millions and they were all complaining. Now you know what Moses' life was like. <laughs> On their journey, there is a refrain that the Israelites use commonly in complaining to Moses. Have you brought us out here into the wilderness to die? We were better off back in Egypt. Of course, they've casually forgotten what life in Egypt was like when they were treated as slaves and abused. But now today, they're out in the wilderness, and the complete people are complaining to Moses, we have no water. We went to Costco and the shelves were all empty. We went to the other stores and there was no water. Some guy on the internet was selling a bottle for $20. Did you bring us out here into the wilderness to die? And so Moses prays. And basically it's, Lord, either help these people or kill me. Because I can't stand it anymore. And so God gives him instructions to take the staff that he had used when he parted the Red Sea and to strike a rock. And when he did, Sufficient water flowed out so that all the people could be nourished. And so it was that the rock was called both Massah and Mirabah. Massah means to test, and Mirabah to find fault. These people of Israel were putting God to the test. From the book of Exodus, chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. From the wilderness of Sain, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah, the test, and Mirbah, quarrel, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Psalm 95 is a marvelous psalm, one that the people may have sung as they climbed the hill to Jerusalem and prepared to worship in the temple. It may have been a part of a New Year's celebration, a festival when we renew God as sovereign ruler over Israel. As it exists now, the psalm is in two parts. Verses 1 through 7 contain a hymn of praise filled with joyful thanksgiving and an exclamation of God's greatness as creator. Verses 6 and 7 present a vivid picture of the procession of worshipers entering the temple and prostrating themselves in reverent homage to God. And then the people acknowledge themselves to be God's people in verse 7, the sheep of his hand. Please turn to page 260 in the front of the hymnals. We'll read Psalm 95, and we'll do it antiphonally 
I'll read the first half of the verse up to the asterisk. You read the second. Psalm 95, page 260. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joy, shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth, and the, and the heights, heights of the hills are his, his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and, and his, his hands have molded the dry, the dry land. land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and, and kneel before, before the Lord, Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, oh that, that today you would hearken to his voice. voice. Hearken not your hearts, as your forebears did in the wilderness, at Mirabah, and on the day at Massah, when they tempted me. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, The people are wayward in their hearts, they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. In Paul's letter to the Romans, which typically, I have said, serves as a primer of the Christian faith. If anybody wants to know what we believe, that's where you point them. The first few chapters point out our sinfulness and our need for God. Chapter 4 is a marvelous testament to faith. Faith like Abraham had when he believed God and blindly followed him. Faith like we have as we trust in God. And then there's chapter 5. And it begins with the word, therefore. And, and as an English teacher, I love that. Paul has said it all up in the first four chapters, and he starts chapter 5 with, therefore. In other words, and he goes on to talk about what it means to live a life of faith. We rejoice in the prospect of sharing God's glory. We rejoice even in our suffering because we know God is with us. And Paul describes for us how even our suffering is a blessing from God. From Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. St. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here ends the New Testament lesson. The fourth chapter of John is a remarkable story. In an age where men ruled society and women had no status whatsoever, this story takes place. In a society where the Jews looked down on anyone who was not Jewish, 
this story takes place. If you want to talk about the scandal of the gospel, here is Jesus going against all the mores and norms of his society and speaking with a Gentile female. Horrors. Who ever heard of such a thing? It's a scandal. It's an outrage. It's the inclusiveness of God's love. We rise with the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to John, the fourth chapter, beginning at the fifth verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks to drink from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him, and must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or, why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you, and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for eternal life.
so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Be seated and we'll sing the sermon hymn. 